A Matter of Principle by James Cotter Chapter 2 Several weeks had passed since the relative calm of the late summer evenings, and though there had been a nip in the air back then, it could not be compared to the start of what would turn out to be a frosty autumn. Frosty indeed in more ways than one for Clive Dundale. Clive took respite from the chilly weather inside a small wooden summer hut, which had a roof, but only just. Enough to keep the rain out at least, and the biting wind. It was like an old cricket pavilion, only smaller, and when mid-afternoon arrived, it only meant one thing to Clive. Lunchtime. And the hut was a perfect spot for a good sit-down and a bite to eat. Unfortunately for Clive, autumn had arrived with a vengeance. A flurry of leaves constantly danced in the air, circling the pavilion, and the feeling of the damp and cold prevailed even inside it. Clive leant up against a small wooden frame of the pavilion, with his rake proudly prumped up beside him, watching the dancing leaves with an air of resigned gloom. The start of autumn always meant more work for him. Winter's always difficult in my line, he despondently proclaimed, as he unwrapped his cheese and pickle sandwich. A never-ending pile of leaves to shovel up. Mess, 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 he scowled and took a bite of his sarnie. Don't get me wrong, Mother Nature may have her suitors, but I'm one of them. I love nature, and I love autumn, but what I don't like is the leaves blocking up the drains. He gestured with his half-eaten sandwich to emphasise his point. It's the busiest season for me, as it is. He took another bite, chewing over the cheese, even as he chewed over his thoughts. The park looks quite sparse at the moment, with a lack of foliage. Lack of it on trees, at least. Take that one over there. He gestured proudly to a bare tree in the distance, with thoughts of it in blossom, filling his mind with a joyous, gleaming pride of the years of care and consideration he had given it. That one when it's in full bloom in the summer. Ah, he is champion. But where are the leaves now? I'll tell you where they are. They're cluttered up the park and blocking up the drains. Clive chomped morosely on his sandwich and poured himself a cup of tea from his trusty old vacuum flask. He took a sip, but his frown deepened and he put the cup down, agitated by his thoughts. This new boss, Mr. Wexford, he's called, he said dismissively. Don't know his first name. He doesn't like to get personal, he says. Fine. He said, spitting out the word, his expression indicating that he was in fact anything but. Clive Dunderhill prided himself on being a good judge of character, and made his mind up about a person almost instantly. Sometimes before that person even so much as uttered a single word. Though Clive had kept his true feelings relatively hidden, he didn't like to judge someone too harshly. Even if he was the type of pen-pushing official, Clive had always tried his level best to avoid. If possible, his frown deepened even further. He cast his mind back to the first fateful meeting, where Mr. Wexford demonstrated how apt he was in the skill of talking down to someone without anyone else in the room noticing. A skill Clive would have almost admired if it wasn't being practised on him. He gave a team talk the other day, he said, waving the remains of his sandwich in the air. I thought, hello, we're not at the football. I don't know who he thinks he is, but... Clive trailed off chuckling to himself like he's got one over on the man already. Said to me that he wanted to discuss team morale, if you please. He snorted at the idea of it. Well, it's never been a problem before. No one's ever brought it up before. That's half the trouble, I think. People are not aware of team morale and all this stuff. It's only when it's brought up and scrutinised, then you start realising. Then the problems start to occur. People get singled out. Clive took a moment to compose himself. We had to play a team-building game, if you can believe it. I said to him, I said, I've got the leaves to do out there. I said, there's half a dozen drains blocked up. I said, they won't do themselves, you know. He said, Clive, I thought, who's getting personal now? It's Mr. Dunderhill to you. He said, Clive, you've got to learn to cooperate within a team. I said, no, I don't. I said, I know Caroline and I know Steve and George over there. I'd get along, but in my area, there's no call for it, I said. I don't need to cooperate. I'm friendly, he said, then remembered being interrupted. Well, that's exactly your problem. You think you're friendly, you're not. 
I said I am. How do you know? You've only just got here. And what does he say to me? He said, I can tell by your aura. I said, what aura is this? Aura in bloody deed. Clive chuckled at the memory of it. Well, he was like Mystic Bloody Meg over there. I thought, aura. I'm a bloody gardener. I don't need to know what my aura is. He's sticking his aura in, and that's what I think of it all. Clive sits and waits. Not a word is uttered. He senses a real exasperation and fills the air, like the fumes of a bonfire wafting over to a once clean and sterile area, once occupied by the pure blue skies and fresh, unpolluted air. And then, like a phoenix from the flames, Clive once more comes to life. He said, Clive, would you help the team build a little raft out of form building blocks? I said, what's the point? He said, it's all team building. See how you work together. I'll be watching. So I went over, you know, and I picked up the odd bit of this form rubbish. Well, I don't know where he gets his ideas from. Clive took another sip of his tea. He's probably one of those. On the old Duke of Edinburgh, you know. It's all scouts and he thinks he can bring it here. Clive slammed his tin cup back on the floor of the pavilion porch again. Well, we're not kiddies for God's sake. And after a while, he said, let's have a look at what you've done. Clive purses his lips and utters disapprovingly. Ooh, we weren't happy. I said, what's wrong with it? It's built, isn't it? He said, yes, but that's not the point. I said, why did you set it then? Why ask us to build the blasted thing? Then say that's not the point. He said it was all about the way you communicate. Clive scowled again, as though the word left a nasty taste in his mouth. I said, the way we communicate, if we build it, we build it. We don't need to communicate. I said, the civil words between us, there's no nastiness here. And he said, well, there is, Clive, because you're raising your voice. I said, I'm not raising my voice, said Clive, doing just that, and causing a blackbird to startle up in the air, his wings flapping. He said, Clive, can you please calm down, take a seat? I said, you don't need to tell me to take a seat. It's you who's setting me off. He said, well, that's all communication, and you're getting it wrong, Clive. No one else is arguing. And I said, that's because you're not talking to anyone else. You're not picking on anyone else apart from me. And he said, I'm not picking on anyone, Clive. You can't go around accusing people. Which is rich seeing as it was him who was picking fights with me. So I stayed out of it. I sat there, watching him talk. He looked at me from time to time. Especially when he was talking about people not being part of a team. He said about going down the pub one day. I said, when? He said, in the evening. I said, I don't work in the evening, so I won't be coming in. Clive chuckled, remembering his small victory. It'll be bonding, he says. I said, how's that going to help me? How's that going to help me mow alone? So he says, what about lunchtime then? So I got my sarnies out. I thought I'm having lunch now before he takes that away from me. He pulled his second sandwich from the Tuffway box, as if to illustrate his point. He didn't like it, but you know, he can lump it. Bonding, Clive said again, reliving the memory. How's that going to help me mow a lawn? He didn't have an answer to that, did he? No, he said. Well, we'll have to have words about this in the next review of you. I said, I don't need a review. I'm not a play. He didn't have anything to say to that either. I walked out. Lunchtime. I know my rights. And with that, Clive set about exercising his rights. Finishing his sandwich, his cup of tea, and casting a critical eye over the swirling leaves that continued to rustle and dance around his pavilion. Matter of Principle was written and read by James Cotter. The script editors were Denise Halfpenny, Bex Harvey, Ian Guy and Mark Pearson. And the script associates were the Slag Brothers. A Matter of Principle is a 2010 low mic production.